Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. Faith is foundation. And last week, as we were concluding this first chapter of 2 Corinthians, I concluded before the last phrase. And that last phrase is such a foundational one. Notice what Paul says. Take out your Bible and look with me to 2 Corinthians. We're going to look at the last few verses of chapter 1 before, for the most part, we're going to do chapter 2 of this epistle. But notice what Paul says at the end of chapter 1. Just four words in the Greek text. For by faith you stand. Now, faith, as I said, is foundational. As I say so often, faith is related to truth. So by faith, by the truth of God, you stand. Now, if you look at many, many different translations, about half insert something. It says, by faith or with faith, you stand, and what's inserted? Firmly. Now, why is that there? Well, it's not in the text, literally, but grammatically, there's a reason for that. Because this word, one word in Greek, you stand. The, the subject is, is placed in with a suffix so that we know it's second person. So by faith, you stand. But the construction of this in the tense speaks about standing, standing that you have in the past, you are now, and you will continue to do so. So it's that confidence that causes some translators to insert, to try to bring out the nuance of this unique tense with, with additional words, firmly. But let me encourage you that we, when we are walking in faith, when we are embracing the truth of God, we will stand. And that concept, simply the word standing, but it has a, a nuance of having been established, having been caused to, to take a stand. And this is important because as these changes become more regular, I'm speaking about changes that are not good in this world. We are going to be called, in fact, we are, to take a stance, to, to stand against in opposition. And we will not be popular, but we will be pleasing to God. Well, now let's move into chapter 2. Now, it's really a continuation of, of what's going on. Remember Paul, he had said earlier that he had, had purpose to come to this congregation to make another visit. And even though he, he wanted to, he says, I do not uh, make decisions. I did not purpose in my mind to do so rashly with, with lightheadedness, but he did so, bringing that under the will of God. I love this phrase, bringing all thoughts captive to the obedience of God. And we're going to see that obedience is always, always on Paul's mind. So when we look now at chapter 2, he says, But I judged of myself this. Meaning, as he considered this and brought it before the Lord prayerfully, seeking God's instruction on that matter, the leadership of the Holy Spirit. He says, I judge concerning myself, this is the intent, and he said, 
that not again to come in sorrow to you. So he's not saying this would be an additional time that I came in sorrow. He's simply saying, I have judged, I've heard the instruction of God that I should not come again to you. And why? Because he did not want to come in sorrow with grief or causing grief. Now, when we read an epistle, whether Paul wrote it or John or Peter or whoever, most of the time, we're only getting part of the dialogue. We don't always know what was the cause that, that brought about one to write an epistle. Now, there's clues and information in the text. And here, someone, and we'll see this clearly, someone has done something that has brought grief to this congregation. And it needs to be dealt with, and apparently there's some disagreement. And Paul, instead of coming and dealing with it, he wants to write something so that he does not come and bring additional grief. Notice what he says in this verse. Verse 2. He says, For if I bring grief to you, meaning if I come in order to deal with this matter personally, he says, it's only going to be another instrument, another cause. When we bring this up again, it's going to be a source of grief. And he says, if I come to you bringing grief, also, who is the one that, that I rejoice over? He says, in regard to you, you are an instrument. You are a cause for my joy, my gladness. I rejoice over you. That's what I want to do, is act in a way that, that brings me great happiness because of my influence in you. Now, I don't want to come and behave in a way that in the end is going to be grievous. He says, and who is the one that that I rejoice over who gladdens me? Is it not the one that, that I am grieving that experiences grief by me? I write to you this same thing in order that I do not come having grief, but he says, rather being necessary for me to rejoice. Now, all he's saying here is he's emphasizing that his work, his influence is to bring joy out of the obedience of this congregation for the things of God, not to simply be an instrument of, of punishment that is going to bring grief. Secondly, and we saw this last week, he wants to encourage them. He wants to tell them, I have confidence in you i trust in you that you are doing the right things so he wants to right now perhaps sharing a little bit of instruction counsel for them but not wanting this this matter to be to be retried rediscussed and then then set in order he feels that for the most part the punishment has fit the crime. And this does speak about something that's so important and oftentimes neglected, and that is discipline among the congregation of the Lord. Members at time need to be disciplined. Things need to be dealt with and set in order. So he writes in the second part of verse 3, trusting upon you, having confidence in you, that, that indeed, my joy is all of you. He's saying, I have confidence, I'm trusting, and how you are dealing with this, that, that it is proper. I trust in what you have done in regard to this matter. Look at verse 3. 
always there are challenges. And he writes, as so frequently he does, for out of much tribulation, and the next word has to do with affliction or that which is stressful. So Paul writes to them, sharing, and by the way, we're going to see two things concerning Paul, his his self in this verse, that he is a loving man, and that he's a sensitive individual. He truly loves these people, and he's sensitive towards them, meaning, just notice what he writes in this verse, for much affliction, tribulation, sorrow, grief, he writes, of the heart that I write to you through, hear this, many tears. So here's this man. He hears about an issue an issue that does indeed need to be put in order, set straight. Someone has done something that has brought grief to this congregation. And Paul is writing now. He says, in much tribulation, in much anxiety, with much stress of heart, I have written to you through much tears, but not in order that you should grieve. And he's speaking here about this. Not in order that that sorrow should be placed upon sorrow, that that grief upon sorrow. He's saying, this is not my motivation, that you be more stern with this person. As I said, Paul is saying, the punishment, how it has already been dealt with, is sufficient. Now, presumably, and many scholars believe this, that Paul has been contacted, word has arrived to him concerning this matter that he comes and he personally deals with it. And Paul is saying, I wanted to come to you that that I could add to your grace meaning, add to your understanding of God's workmanship in a person's life, how God moves to edify, to build up that person. He says, that's why I wanted to come. But I have judged, giving this serious thought not to come because if I come, it's going to be this matter that is going to be discussed, and I don't want to discuss it any longer. In fact, he says, instead of dealing with it and adding, adding grief and sorrow perhaps more punishment notice what he says here he says i have written middle of verse 4 to you through much tears not that you should grieve all the more but in order that you know that i have abounding for you love now i really didn't do a good job translating this because the love that paul is speaking of comes much earlier in the text he says literally but it's hard to render this but let's try but not that you should grieve but meaning in contrast to that and the next thing he says the love specifies the love in order that you should know what I have in abundance for you. Now, what does he have in abundance? Well, in our mind, we need to put abundance and love because it's abundant love that Paul is is having, that he abounds with this love for them. But to make it smooth into English, it's difficult to put love at the beginning and have it stand by itself for a moment but this is all the nuance of the biblical language how word order can in greek be be greatly changed and altered from our mindset in order that the things are are emphasized set aside put at a place of prominence and that's what paul does he says the love i want that you should know that I have all in abundance for you. So he speaks 
in great emotional terms. Look now to verse 5. But if a certain one has brought grief. Now, he's going to come to the end of this, but he wants to give some counsel. Some counsel that is sufficient and, and lays the foundation of, of the lack of necessity that he comes personally. So he says, but if, or we could say since, a certain one has, has grieved, brought grief, but he says, not to me has he grieved. Paul personally hasn't been affected by this. Paul does not have firsthand sorrow that this one has caused him. Now, Paul is, is grieved that, that it's happened. He feels bad that the congregation is in this situation. But he says, it's, it's not personal to me. This one hasn't done anything to me. And then he goes on and writes, but, and there's expression, from part. And that means proportionally. He's saying, this one hasn't grieved me. This has not been the situation. And therefore, I want you as someone who's on the outside, someone who's not experienced a hurt firsthand. And oftentimes, we know in the judicial system in many countries, if the one who is giving judgment is connected, he's supposed to recluse himself. He's not supposed to get involved. Why? It's hard to separate your own personal feelings if you are at, at related to the issue in order to make a right judgment. So Paul is saying, I don't need to recuse myself because... I'm not personally connected to this. If he has caused grief, it's not me that he is grieved, but proportionally in order that not severely, not to too much of an extent upon all of you. So he's saying it's hard to, to grasp this just from the literalness of the words. But what he is instructing is that we ought not be too stern. The, the, the punishment ought to fit the offense. It's not to be so stern simply to say that we're so angry and we're mad and we're hurt about it. And there he goes. Look at verse 6. He uses the word sufficient. Sufficient to this one is the rebuke by, here it is, the majority. The majority, the congregation has come together, they've dealt with it. The majority has said, here's what the response should be to this one who has brought sorrow upon us. It has been dealt with, but apparently there are those who feel it is not sufficient. And now Paul, rather than coming personally and bringing this all up again, he simply wants to share with them a few brief words. And he says, sufficient to this one, the offender, in other words, is the rebuke, the, the punishment, which was by the majority, verse 7. So that contrary, now this is a, a big phrase so contrary or but in contrast to what this minority wants he says instead of making the punishment more severe he says this all the more so you should be forgiving and encouraging less the abundance of sorrow upon this one swallows him up now paul wants restoration he wants this person to be brought back into the congregation where they can become productive a servant but i need to deal with something because if we're not careful this is going to be taken in a direction that it ought not 
There are offenses, there are sinful behaviors that will disqualify someone from a position. But even though they are disqualified from serving in that position ever again, for example, a congregational leader, a pastor, a shepherd of the congregation, the ruling elder or a deacon, they might do something that disqualifies them from serving. So they lose that title, they lose that position, but that doesn't mean that we can't restore them to the congregation, to the fellowship of believers. It doesn't mean that we can't love them and pray for them and accept them as brothers or sisters among us. So do not confuse restoration to the body of believers, meaning always, always it's God's will to restore such a person to, to that previous role. This is not what he's saying here. He's simply saying, don't set this one alone outside of the congregation. There should be a desire to restore him and not just heap upon him continual punishment and punishment. So he writes again, look if you would to the end of verse 7, so that contrary, rather you forgive and encourage less the, the abundance of grief or sorrow through this punishment that, that such a one is consumed that he swallowed up. Verse 8. Therefore, I encourage you. This is a word of beseeching. I beseech you to certify upon him. Here it is. Certify upon him love. That he is still loved by, by the congregation. That they don't hate him. They may truly have contempt for whatever the offense was. That's appropriate. We, we hate such behavior, but we still love the offender. But here's the, the caveat. We love them, but whether they're going to be recipients of love and restoration to the fellowship depends upon true repentance, acknowledgement of the offense as wrong. If they do not repent, they do not confess they do not own up to it, then there's not going to be a restoration to the fellowship. So he writes here, in order that they certify the love, the love of God for this one. Verse, verse 9. For to this also I have written. This is one of the main things that he's writing that they affirm their love for him in order, he says, that I should know your documentation. It's literally what it says. It's a word for proof. He says, I'm writing, not that you keep more punishment, but I am instructing and counseling and, and encouraging you to place upon this one love restore him to the fellowship that i might know this is this last verse we're dealing with that i might know the proof your proof that you're truly believers meaning this one of the things that document that prove our faith is our willingness to forgive i'm going to say that again one of the things, and I would say a primary factor, in proving one's faith, having received the gospel, that one's willingness to forgive, to forgive completely, thoroughly, to put it aside. Now, that does not mean that the one who offended, that there might not be consequences but one can still forgive. Forgiveness does not mean removing all the consequences. That is not a biblical teaching. There are consequences to sin. Certain sins have serious and long-term 
consequences and perhaps all of one's life. So realize that, but that love can still be placed upon this one. So he says, in order that I might know your proof for that in all things you are obedient ones. Now, he says all things, and I believe what's really at the the foundation of this, this statement is that one of the hardest things, one of the things that truly document our faith, our obedience, is forgiveness. If we don't forgive, we have been forgiven. Therefore, we need to practice forgiveness. Look now to to look verse 10. But to, to you, it says, what you have forgiven, also I. Paul saying, if you forgive him, it's a done matter with me. I also, the implication is, have forgotten, for, forgot and forgiven. For also I have forgiven what I have forgiven on account of you. Notice he says, that which I have forgiven, I have forgiven on account of you. What's he doing? He's teaching a principle. He says, because you have forgiven, I will also forgive. And this is how we should understand our forgiveness that we have received from God. Because God has forgiven me, I will also forgive others. So Paul's living Living this out, he writes, For also I, since uh, uh, I have forgiven what you have forgiven on account of you, he says, in the presence. It's literally among the face of Messiah, in the presence of Christ. Why? Well, now he's going to get to a real significant matter. What are the consequences when when forgiveness is not not given? When I say I, I simply will not forgive that person. Well, notice what he says. He writes, in order that, he says, I do this before the presence of Messiah, in order that not being uh, uh, outwitted or deceive, deceived, and it's really, a word of doing something that gives the enemy, and we're going to see that Satan is going to be spoken of in a moment, that gives the enemy an advantage. Here's the biblical truth. When I am unforgiving, I'm giving an advantage over my life to Satan. That's a biblical fact. You need to realize that. When you, when I, I, when we are unforgiving, we forget the forgiveness that we have received from him and we don't similarly forgive others. What we are doing is giving advantage to our enemy, the one that hates us, our adversary, the one that wants to bring adversity into our life. We're giving him an advantage. That is a very dangerous position to find yourself within. Now, I hope that motivates all of us, motivates me to be more forgiving. Look again, verse verse 11. In order that we do not give an advantage to Satan, and then he writes, for his schemes... He says, we are not ignorant of, we are not against knowing. We need to know his schemes. And one of the things that he loves is unforgiveness. He will plant, he will put thoughts in your mind about, you shouldn't forgive that one. Don't you, you need to remember what he did. He's probably going to do it again. This this is her MO. This is how she operates. You don't want to be taken advantage of. He tells you, don't be taken advantage of, but in your lack of forgiveness, he's going to take advantage of you. That's what Paul is revealing in this. Verse 
verse 12. Now, Paul speaking and saying, I'm, I'm not coming to you. But he's speaking about his travels. Paul's on the move. He's not idle. He's ministering. He's serving. Verse 12. But after coming into Troas, why did he come there? For the gospel of Messiah. Now, some Bibles will put in for the preaching of it, and obviously that, that is why he went, but it simply says, for the gospel of Messiah. Foundationally, what Paul's life became about was the gospel of Messiah. And that gospel teaches about the work of Messiah, the successful, all-sufficient work of Messiah that brings change, eternal change into my life, that puts me on a course, on a journey of pursuing God's will. If you've received something that has been presented as the gospel, but you are not committed to, you do not have a passion for the will of God, you haven't believed the biblical gospel. And again, my salvation is not dependent upon me. How I pursue, am I doing a great job of it? We sometimes are weak. We sometimes fail. But if I'm uninterested in the will of God, I'm not studying to know what the will of God is, that makes one so-called proclamation profession of faith highly questionable i don't judge you're not to judge we have one judge all judgment has been given to messiah but we can warn if you're not interested in the will of god you have really got to question whether you have received the true gospel the only gospel so paul says after coming to troas for the gospel of Messiah a, a door to me was open meaning something brought about an open door for him there in notice what it says in the Lord so things are going well but he says I did not have rest in my spirit there was an opportunity but Paul remember what he says earlier he does nothing in a frivolous manner he just talked about the schemes of the enemy satanic schemes and plots plots and such and he says there was a door open to me there in Troas, in the lord but he says i did not pay very close attention he says but i did not have rest in my spirit not finding i did not find timothy my brother but what did he do he says but leaving them he says i departed for macedonia and for some reason the spirit of god was moving paul he's spoken about macedonia a few times in the previous chapter and now, this is where God, even though he had opportunity, don't take advantage of just every opportunity. We need to be convinced in our spirit from the counsel of God, from the leadership of the Spirit of God, what opportunities to, to take hold of. So he says, not finding Timothy, my brother, but leaving them, I departed into Macedonia, verse 14. But God, and the word here, many will say, but to God I give thanks, thanksgiving to God. It's literally the word charis, which is grace. And the important thing here is when you study the word of God in the original language, you find that so frequently in translations, they use a multiplicity of definitions for the same biblical word. And the problem is we don't learn how multifaceted 
grace is. That grace is a source of thanksgiving. It is. Grace is a source of perseverance. Grace is a source of determination to the will of God for the purposes of God. And of course, grace saves. But here, Paul is writing, look carefully, verse 14. But to God, his thanks is grace, always. Why? Well, this always can be for giving God thanks, acknowledging his grace always, or that always he makes us triumphant in the Messiah. Now, in Messiah, it's in the dative which means can be in and for Messiah. I'm in him because I'm for him. I am submissive. I have subjected myself to him for his purposes. So it's just not, I believe in Messiah, therefore I'm always going to triumph in things. Didn't say that whatsoever. That is a false, insufficient, uh, immature understanding of the biblical text. The text says, I am, am gracious. I give grace to God, meaning thanks. I acknowledge him always because always I triumph, but in Messiah, but it also says for Messiah. This, these two thoughts are, are captured in the use of the dative in this passage. Second part of verse 14 and, and a spirit of his knowledge, we manifest or manifested through us in all ways or all places. So Paul is saying here, we are triumphing always. Why? Because we are about him, for him, in him, for him, and this manifests itself out as a, and he uses a word here that's related to a, a pleasing fragrance unto the Lord, like an incense offering, which was something that was pleasing to God to find favor. But favor for what purpose? Here's the problem. A immature student of the scripture will say this. This, these sweet-smelling aromas, fragrant offerings, offerings to God, incense offerings, they're pleasing, the scripture says, in, in its poetic language, in his nostrils. It pleases him. Why? So that he'll do what I want. False teaching, heresy, idolatrous. No, we want to be people who are a sweet aroma to God and give that off. Why? So that his will is done. Here's the problem. There are so frequently today people who misunderstand the concept of the sovereignty of God. They think God's sovereign. He is sovereign. We all should embrace that. God is sovereign. But that does not mean that God, because he's sovereign, always his will is done. Sin is a violation of it. There are things happening all the time. Satan is at work in your life against you so that God's will isn't taking place, so that you twist and turn from the things, the will of God. So he writes here, and a aroma, of his knowledge being manifested through us in all places or at all times or in all things. Verse 15, that a fragrance, so it's a different word. The first word was aroma. This is the word for fragrance or a very pleasing perfume. He says, but a perfume of Messiah, that means belonging to Messiah. We are to God among the ones who are being saved and among the ones that are being condemned. Now, it's a sweet perfume 
We are to God, of God, before the ones who are being saved and those who are being condemned, who are perishing. Why? See, I mentioned earlier on in the first part of our worship service, if you're just hearing the teaching, you won't know this, but I gave an example of a false presentation of good news. And the problem is, in this false presentation, there is never this concept of judgment, God's punishment, God's condemnation. See, people, that's not popular. People aren't going to fill stadiums for, for a God who will condemn those who violate his standards and who don't turn looking for his forgiveness. There's people that just reject the standards of God, the commandments of God, the truth of God. They want God to love them, work for them, serve them. That's idolatry, by the way. They want that, and they'll embrace God by any name if it's a God that does what they want. And the problem today is this. People are thinking because there's a falling way. See, this same individual that I mentioned earlier before our, our teaching, he's concerned about numbers. He's concerned about the departure, why people are leaving. They're leaving because they've never believed the truth. And when they are confronted with the truth, they don't like it. They said, this is not what we signed up for. This is not what we believe. They were false believers. So what we need to do is put forth truth. And Paul is saying here, we behave, we are a sweet perfume of God. Before among those who are being saved, but also, also, among those who are being condemned. Because when that knowledge of his, his knowledge is presented, it's going to reveal those who will be saved and those who will be condemned. That's what he's saying. Verse 16. So then, on one hand, a to those a fragrance of death to the ones who are dead. But to the ones who are alive, a, a fragrance of life. So that same gospel, it either proclaims life, eternal life, or death, eternal death. And that is pleasing to God because that's the truth. No matter who you are, every human being is going to experience one of these two things. There's nothing in between. Either eternal life or eternal condemnation, death. And death is eternal. Don't believe the false teaching that is rising up today that eternal life, meaning the eternity, is only for a believer. That those who are not believers, they come to an end. They do not. They experience eternal condemnation. That's why the book of Revelation speaks about that smoke rising up over and over eternity and eternity. That's what the Word of God teaches. He says, and, and to these things, this is something that is sufficient. And there's much debate about how to understand this last part of, of verse 16. But I would suggest to you that being a fragrance of God, proclaiming life to the ones being saved and death, to the ones being condemned. That's sufficient. This is sufficient for the existence of, of you and me. This should be enough for our life that we're used in this way. This is also the sufficiency of, of the gospel. It proclaims life and death. Last verse, look at verse 17. Verse 17 is a, a very meaningful verse to me. It is really the foundation of what a teaching ministry should be about. And it's just very simple to understand. He writes, let's just read it. For we are not as the many. 
Now, it's interesting because, and, and this needs to shape something. Paul is saying, we are not like the many. Who's he talking about? Fellow apostles. Not the apostles that we read about in the scripture. He's not talking about Peter and the other ones who are true apostles. But he's saying, in his day, and it's true today, even more so, there are many false ones who claim to be sent by God, but they are not. And the majority, hear this, when we look here, it's oi por loi. And it emphasizes this. He says, we are not as the, the many, the ones peddling, who has made the word of God a, a business, a, a, a means to income. He says, we are not like the many, the numerous, the ones who peddle the word of God, but, he says, the word of God that he shares, he says, he does so out of simplicity. And that word simplicity also has a nuance of transparency. Paul wants people to see, and this should be all every Bible teacher's objective, is that we want people to see how what we are sharing is firmly rooted in the Word of God. One reason for that, personally, if I err, if I teach incorrectly, at least if I am, am constantly taking what I'm saying and basing upon the Word of God, people will be more likely to say, what Brooke just said is not right. And they won't be led astray by me. That's my fear, my concern. I don't want to lead people in the wrong direction. That's why, as Paul says, we don't do things frivolously with lightheadedness. We want to pay attention to the Word of God, how it was constructed, the grammar, everything, the vocabulary, so that we give truth. We don't want to be peddlers of the Word of God, but we want to be as people who do so from sincerity, as from God. And then we have a word. It's a phrase, before. We do so as from God, being before Him and in Messiah, in Him, being in a covenantal relationship, walking with Him, being in His character, He says, we speak. So let me just say, if you, in any degree, whether you share with a few men, a few women at your home over a, a coffee time or whatever, more and more people, they, they, they get individuals together, two, three, maybe just one, and the disciple at a coffee shop, going over to someone's home, a small group, no matter what sphere of influence you have, whether it's one, three, five, ten, fifty, whatever, you want to do it. And be in Messiah, speaking him, realizing that God is there. He is watching. And we want to speak from him with transparency, with simplicity, with a commitment to the truth. That is Paul's method of being an apostle. Well, I'll close with that. Until next week, shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. <laughs>